That statewide search underway right now at this hour for the suspect in that Thanksgiving shooting who suddenly opened fire on his own family members and then took off. ABC's Jeffrey Kaufman has the latest this morning from Jupiter, Florida. Jeffrey, good morning. And good morning to you, David. It was a family Thanksgiving dinner that turned into a family tragedy. Police are still hunting for the man they believed killed four of his relatives, including a little girl. We do know that there was an ongoing resentment between him and several family members inside the home. The cold-blooded killings have shattered the idyllic calm of this Florida community on this holiday weekend. Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime, unsolved mystery, missing people, urban legends, and the dark side of the Sunshine State. If you'd like to support our show and get a bunch of extra Paradise After Dark content, please sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. That's P-A-L-A-M-A-H-A-W-K. And be sure to visit our website at paradiseafterdark.com. On our website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, our mailing list, our social medias, and of course, our Patreon. And we also have a virtual tip jar there where you can leave us a tip and we'll give you a shout out on the show. So, Lauren. Ken. Let's talk about Thanksgiving real quick. We just got done with the Halloween episode. Yeah, it was a great I hope, episode. I hope that you guys enjoyed that. I hope you listened to the episode and then also watched the accompanying YouTube video. I flew all the way to Iowa for that. It <laughs> <laughs> was so, a great time. I had a good time, but um, you know, it's it was always very fun. spooky. I bet it was. It was very spooky. But it had to be fun, though. It was fun, but Halloween's over and now we're on to Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving. Um, I love the food. I've been on a diet for three weeks just so I could eat as much food as I want at Thanksgiving. What's your favorite Thanksgiving food? Turkey for you and turkey for me. I can't <laughs> sing anymore because we have no money. Um, I would have to say, honestly, yams. Yeah. My type of yams. Not that mashed up stuff like the ingredients or the recipe on the side of the can. I like yams with the syrup and the butter and the marshmallows i mean it's instant fattening and i love it so delicious it tastes like heart attack in a it's in a spoonful it is beautiful <laughs> oh, i'm getting excited about it right now i like turkey but i like the turkey that ken cooks ken grills our turkey on the grill like on Come. the propane grill and it is so moist and delicious it's amazing isn't it? i said I moist it. You said moist. <laughs> a lot of people, I, but then, but then, my mom makes the best stuffing in the world. It is good. I can eat her stuffing, and it has things in there I don't even really like to eat. I know. Although my she mom does make makes special stuffing for me without onions. Exactly. She does. She makes a special little batch for Ken with no onions in it. That's my mother in law. What do you want? No, um, but I like Thanksgiving because I liked it. I like the idea of reflecting back on everything that you're thankful for. Mm-hmm. So we've, I feel like this year, 2021, we have a lot more to be thankful for than we did last year. To well, last be year, you, you couldn't do anything to be thankful for. You just kind of <laughs> stuck. Well, I mean, this year, I mean, keeping it podcast focused, we got to be at CrimeCon, mm-hmm. which was awesome. We've done really well. We've had a good year, a prosperous year. Oh yeah, we've and still we've met a lot of new a lot of new people. We've got some um, uh, great connections with other podcasters and stuff. We so haven't this year killed we, each other. Exactly, that's good. That's, that's good. Yeah, although, our, our marriage is still intact. Although we were talking about going to the Grand Canyon next year, um, right before CrimeCon, so we'll see how that works. We'll see out. if he pushes me over the edge. Yeah, I don't know how I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get trying to get everything to fall into place. I mean, fall into place. I mean, that's bad terminology. Sorry. <laughs> So anyway, Thanksgiving is our next big holiday, and this is going to be our last episode before Thanksgiving. So we want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. And speaking of Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Day, November 26th of 2009, 12 years ago, 
An unexpected guest appeared at a family member's home for dinner in Jupiter, Florida. Now, this man had been asking his parents for days about the Thanksgiving event, but never committed to attending. And his parents never alerted their hosts, Jim and Muriel Sitton, the man's cousins, that he might be coming. Although unexpected, with 16 family members already present, he was welcome to the festivities. After the meal, the family gathered around the piano and sang Christmas carols. Jim and Muriel's six-year-old daughter, Michaela, gave the family a sneak preview of the dance she was to perform the following evening in a presentation of the Nutcracker. But after that, Paul Michael Marriage, 35 years old, who had been behaving normally and celebrating with the family all evening, went to his car, returned back inside with a gun. Out of nowhere, the wholesome family gathering turned into a nightmare. Marriage first shot and killed his twin sisters, Carla Marriage and Lisa Knight. Lisa, pregnant at the time, both women were 33 years old. Paul then shot and killed his 76-year-old aunt, Raymond Joseph, once in the shoulder, and then as her husband cowered on the ground next to her, trying to stop the bleeding, he held the gun to her chest and fired again, blowing a hole in her sternum. His brother-in-law, Patrick Knight, was also shot in the stomach and spent three months in a medically induced coma, but survived. Paul shot 52-year-old Clifford Germara before heading to Michaela's room. Clifford survived the shooting. His final victim was six-year-old Michaela Sitton, who was sleeping in a nearby bedroom when he gunned her down. Paul shot Michaela once, walked out of the room, then re-entered the room and shot her again, making sure that she was dead. At one point, according to Jim Sitton, marriage turned and started to walk away and said, I've been waiting 20 years to do this. After the shooting, marriage vanished. Later, it would come out in police reports that his family feared this exact thing might happen. According to reports obtained by the Sun Sentinel, when he called that evening to announce he was on his way, his mother couldn't resist a sinister thought. I hope he doesn't come and kill us all tonight, Carol Marriage recalled telling her daughter, Lisa Knight, according to a Jupiter police report. Mom, it came to my mind, her daughter replied. But don't say that to dad, because dad would get upset that we had such ideas. It's that that premonition or intuition thing. Yeah. If only. Well, Paul Marriage had a seemingly normal upbringing. He was well-liked in school and made good grades. And according to the Palm Beach Post, he played football, baseball, soccer. He led the French Honor Society. So all in all, throughout school, was just a really good person. Now. Described by those who knew him, he was driven and mature. So being an athlete, you can only imagine he was handsome, fit, but he's personable but quiet. Now, Marriage graduated third in his class from Gulliver Prep. This is a pricey haven for children of Miami's well-to-do. Now, I thought he'd be running a company or a business or something like that, said Bob Schweed, who was Marriage's football coach for half a season. Now, Marriage pushed himself hard, Schweed recalled. He was a kicker, and kicking is a specialty, not something that would be taught in practice. So he practiced on his own. In class, he was confident and had a plan. Go to the University of Miami, become a doctor. But by the time the Thanksgiving massacre occurred, Marriage had a 16-year history of mental illness that began with a breakdown while he was an honor student at the University of Miami. Everything was perfect until he turned 19, said his mother, Carol. After his breakdown, marriage moved back in with his parents. He had trouble keeping a job and couldn't support himself. His mother said he suffered from obsessive compulsive disorder and chronic depression and had some sort of grudge against his family for over a decade. Records show he was arrested in Miami-Dade County in 1998 on a misdemeanor charge of disorderly conduct. A long-term acquaintance referred to him as mentally troubled. He once shot himself in a supposed suicide attempt and allegedly threatened once to cut the throat of one of his sisters. Court documents showed marriage and his siblings had a troubled history. Nearly a decade beforehand, marriage sought a protection order from law enforcement after he accused his sister of trying to kill him, according to records obtained by the Miami Herald. 
he dropped the request a few weeks later. In 2006, his sister Carla had to file a restraining order against him. Her brother's threat to slit her throat was just the latest of many that, quote, occur on a regular basis. Marriage suffers from mental illness but refuses to take his medication, she said in the petition. She also withdrew her request a few weeks later. At the time of the murders, Paul Marriage had been living alone in a Coral Gables apartment. His father, Michael, said he and his wife and their twin daughters were not close with their only son because he was always accusing them of not taking care of him, according to a police report. Daddy issues much? Marriage's family rarely talked about him to others, according to a friend, Alan Harrelal. He was never really spoken about, Harrelal wrote in an email to the Sun Sentinel, but those who knew about him knew that he suffered from mental unstableness, but was supposed to be on medication. Some of their friends didn't even know that Lisa and Carla had a brother. There was also a history of violence in Marriage's family. Now, Marriage's aunt on his father's side, Saul Marriage Abrams, murdered her ex-husband and two children in July of 1973 before she overdosed and died after five days in a coma. A popular mezzo-soprano, Marriage Adams, had given up her opera career to care for her family. After 19 years, her husband, James Adams, who was a pilot, left her for a flight attendant and the two eventually got divorced. Now, shortly after their final hearing on the divorce, Marriage Adams asked him to come over to the family's home in Miami to talk. Now, unbeknownst to Adams, his former wife had bundled the two children, 14-year-old Jack and 10-year-old Melissa Ann, into her car along with the family's dog. Now, after shooting Adams four times in the chest in the master bedroom with a 38 caliber revolver, she invited Jack back inside, her son, emptied the gun into his body, and then brought Melissa Ann into a different room where she too was shot and killed. Now, Marriage Adams then swallowed a handful of barbiturates and later died at South Mammy Hospital. Yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. What the actual fuck? Well, mental illness does is hereditary. So, and back in the 70s. And this is his father's sister. Right. Okay. So, back to our crime scene here. By the time the police arrived at the scene of the crime, Paul was nowhere to be found. But it was clear that the massacre was planned. Court records show that in the weeks before the meal, he had painstakingly and discreetly spent $2,000 on at least four guns and ammunition in two Broward County gun shops. He even asked for a scope to be attached to a bolt-action Remington 700 rifle. He said he wanted to use it for hunting. He also withdrew $12,000 in cash, and he was officially on the run. And after a little more than a month later, on January 2nd, 2010, Paul Pfaff of Long Key, Florida, was watching the football game on Fox TV when a preview of America's Most Wanted came on. Now, a picture of Paul Marriage flashed on the screen, and Pfaff realized that that was the man who was a guest in his motel. There was no doubt because we have a big screen TV in the house, said Melinda Pfaff, who co-owns the Edgewater Lodge in Long Key, Florida, with her husband. It just shocked my husband to the core. Melinda Pfaff said she went on to the America's Most Wanted website to verify that the photo that was shown on the commercial was indeed the man that she saw and that was staying at the motel, and then she called the police. I called in the tip, and the dispatcher said, How sure are you on a scale of 1 to 10? Pfaff said, I said a 10. You need to get here now. Now, although Marriage had shaved his head and covered his blue Toyota Camry, the 2007 Camry that he had with a car cover, and switched its license plate. Now, this is the car that the police were actually looking for. And so they show up and realize all this stuff, put it together, and then he was caught. According to the FAFs, marriage checked into the Edgewater Lodge, which is a three-hour drive from the scene of the crime in Jupiter, Florida, checked in on December 2nd of 2009. So it's one month that he'd been staying there, but it was six days after the murders. John Walsh, the host of America's Most Wanted, made it a personal mission to locate the suspect in this Thanksgiving Day killings. Now, he held a press conference with Jim Sitton. Now, he's the father of the murdered six-year-old Michaela in late December, urging the public to continue to look for the suspect, whose face was plastered on wanted posters in several Florida neighborhoods. This family needs justice, needs closure, Walsh said. 
America needs to saddle up and find this guy. Now, U.S. Marshals, along with officers from several area police departments, arrested marriage a few hours after this tip was received. Now, this is why I feel like podcast and news media and just like blasting the stuff out there the best you can can really alter an investigation. I mean, here yeah. they're sitting there watching football and a preview of America's Most Wanted comes on and, hey, we're looking for this guy. And it hits the right eyes at the right time. And I think that that's why Lauren is so adamant about covering a lot of unsolved stuff. And I think that's why she really enjoys doing the podcast, as do I. But it's one of those where if you just get the right ears, the right eyes, sometimes you hit those right senses at the right time, boom, yeah. you know, change the investigation and really turns it into within a cap- couple hours of them seeing his face on TV, boom, he's arrested. Yep. Now, marriage was then charged with four counts of premeditated murder and three counts attempted first-degree murder. There is a weight lifted off our shoulders, obviously, by making this apprehension, Jupiter Police Chief Frank Kitsaro said at a news conference to announce the arrest. I always knew justice would be served, said Jim Sitton. This does not bring my daughter back, so I'm not jumping up and down with jubilation, but at least I'll be able to sleep knowing the monster's not right outside my door. After his capture on January 2nd, Marriage seemed dazed by his own deeds and worried about his future. Records show he rambled on in a police interrogation, implicating himself in the murders without discussing them directly. It's impossible, you know, to reconcile what happened with me, he said. It's just, it's not even real. I'm not violent. I've never been violent. I'm not a criminal or a drug addict. It's just unbelievable what I've done to everybody. Seemingly unaware of the workings of the court system, and the scale of criminal charges that he would face, he asked police officers if he would be facing a long process. A year? Two years, he asked? Told that the wait for a trial could be lengthy, he wondered what would happen next. What about afterwards, he asked? What's the worst-case scenario for this? Speaking of worst-case scenario for marriage, after his capture, both Sitton and John Walsh called on state attorney Michael McAuliffe to seek to have marriage executed. Marriage was expected to go to trial, and the state announced that they were going to seek the death penalty. The decision by prosecutors to seek death by lethal injection came as a grand jury formally indicted the 35-year-old Miami man on four counts of first-degree murder and three counts of attempted first-degree murder, not necessarily the phone calls from Sitton and John Walsh. His parents, who supported him financially, even as a grown man, refused to hire a private defense attorney for marriage, so he was represented by Carrie Hotwoot, the county's public defender. Were you aware that the judge in this trial was not a fit judge to – he was not a fit judge to be in a – to judge a death penalty case? So they found another judge to step in and take over and answer questions up until the trial while he went and got all of the stuff he needed certifications to take this trial on. I did not know that. Yeah, it was a pretty interesting read. So the judge is like, look, I'm going to take this case, but I can't because I'm not certified. So another judge stepped in and said, okay, I'll handle all of the pre-trial stuff, pre-trial stuff if there's questions leading up to it. So he went and got all the certifications he needed to become the judge in this case. Hmm. It's pretty interesting little fact. So... That's my little aside. It's the best, you know, my little aside. <laughs> Thank you gonna, for that. You're welcome. It's a bunch of nothing, but it's something. Now, it was Patrick Knight. Now, this is Marriage's brother-in-law and a board-certified trial lawyer from Miami who would likely be a star witness for the prosecution in the trial. Lying shot and wounded on the living room floor, it was he who witnessed Marriage shoot Michaela once, leave the room, and then re-enter. Now, mind you, Michaela, Michaela was Jim Sitton's daughter, but... Patrick Knight's wife, Lisa, is the one who was murdered and she was pregnant. Right. So this is really a tough situation for a man who's been injured, he's wounded, he's there, and he gets to watch this all go down for a child when he's expecting and he doesn't really know the whole grasp of everything that's going on. So Knight told investigators in March of 2010, it was quick. Now, this is after awaking from a medically induced coma. He went and shot her and came out and almost instantly, like a second thought, went right back in and shot her again, I guess to make sure she was dead. 
Now, months later, sitting in the Palm Beach County Jail, Marriage seemed shaken by the horrors of his alleged deeds. He called his father Collect at his Miami area home, begging forgiveness. I think about them, he told his father. I think about heaven, you know. I think about them constantly. I don't know how I could have done what I've done to everybody, everybody I've hurt. His father, sounding dry and defeated in a static-filled recording of the jail phone call, had by then given marriage an accounting of the wreckage. So his father sort of told him everything that's going on. We have nothing, he told his son. You have nothing. It's a total nightmare. Our lives have changed forever. Hopefully after the case, hopefully I get, I get sent to a hospital, he told his father in the phone call from jail. The trial was slated to begin in January of 2012, and his defense had already announced that they had planned to use the insanity defense. But there was no trial. In October of 2011, Marriage pled guilty after making a deal that would spare him the death penalty. He received seven life terms instead. After hearing from relatives of the victims, Palm Beach County Circuit Judge Joseph Marks sentenced Paul Marriage to seven life terms. As part of the agreement, the defendant would waive any right of appeal. You will never see the light of day, Marks told the then 37-year-old Marriage in front of a packed West Palm Beach courtroom. The plea caused a rift in the family. Marriage's brother-in-law, Patrick Knight, who lost his wife, his unborn baby, and was himself gravely wounded in the shooting, said he was eager to move on from the tragedy instead of enduring year- years of appeals. But Jim Sitton, Michaela's father, objected to the agreement, and he wanted marriage to go to trial and potentially face the death penalty. You remember the, the meal was at Jim Sitton's home. Yes. He urged the judge to delay the sentencing so he could, quote, prepare a proper presentation with an attorney to detail his argument. Near the end of his statement, the judge sternly told Sitton, then carrying a large picture of his daughter, to stop after he knelt down on his knees to beg the judge. This plea decision is far too important to rush through without any time for us. For all of us to think, said Sitton, accusing the state of trying to push the deal through, we've been waiting patiently for almost two years for this case to come to trial. Justice is what's at stake here. I can I can understand where he's coming from. Well, his daughter was murdered. Yeah. I mean, Obviously, he's a grieving father. And angry. And angry. You know, he's, he's in the anger phase. I get it. After the court proceeding, State Attorney Michael McAuliffe released a statement in which he said that after careful evaluation and consideration, he decided to accept marriage's plea, having determined it is an appropriate resolution to the case. Noting the disparate opinions among the victims' families and about the death penalty generally, McAuliffe said he felt it sufficient that marriage will have no hope of having favorable results by the court and will have no ability to affect the lives of those he's harmed. I believe that seven consecutive life sentences recognize the heinous nature of the crimes and adequately punish the defendant, he said. Well, you got to stop and think about this for a second. I mean, that's a smart move because you he's been probably been through this before. The family is just angry and grieving and like we just discussed. So we're going to take this to trial, and all we're going to do is we're going to go step by step to the murders. We're going to relive this event numerous times, and the family's going to have to relive it numerous times. So you're going to start dragging those feelings out. So I think that this is a, a very well-educated, somebody with experience move to say, oh, look, let's just take the plea. Let's do this because we don't want to continue reliving this where a family has basically been destroyed by this one man, and everybody has to relive it again. So I, I, it makes sense to me. This one incident didn't just tear a family apart, it completely obliterated them. Muriel and Jim Sitton sued their cousins, Michael and Carol Marriage, for inviting their son to the Thanksgiving dinner, alleging that the Marriages knew their son was dangerous, but did not tell the other 14 members of the family that were invited to the dinner that he was coming. In the lawsuit, the Sittons claim the Marriages secretly invited their son and didn't tell the hosts. If someone brought a rattlesnake or a pit bull to your home without your permission and that pit bull started attacking and killing people, wouldn't you hold that person responsible, Jim Sutton said. 
That's what this is. We're seeking justice with every means at our disposal. You know, that's a good analogy. I didn't even think of it that way. The Sittens also said the marriages did nothing to stop their son once he started shooting at relatives, and they could have stepped in and possibly saved Michaela, who was in her bedroom. Yeah, but how are you going to jump in? I mean, when somebody's I, shooting, and you, you, your reaction is to run. The lawsuit was eventually dismissed in 2012 after it was determined the marriages had no legal right or ability to control the actions of their son. But... But that wasn't the only lawsuit that was filed as a result of this crime. Patrick Knight also sued his former in-laws for failing to prevent the killings, including the death of their daughter and his wife, Lisa. Then the marriages filed a countersuit against the Sittens in 2011, alleging the Sittens were to blame for the bloodbath. Now, WPTV, West Palm Beach's NBC affiliate, reported, To the extent Paul had problems, the entire family knew that, said the marriage's attorney, Alan Rawson. If the Sittens were concerned he was going to be a problem that day, they should have stopped them. It was their house. They should have protected their family as well as the marriage family if they were concerned. Now, in the lawsuit, the marriages also claim Jim Sitton has defamed them with unfair and untrue statements about the couple by saying they invited Paul to the dinner without notifying other members of the family and knowing his reputation for violence. Now, also named in the lawsuit is Dr. Antoine Joseph, whose wife was murdered by marriage. Now, Joseph is Muriel Sitton's father. His sister is Carol Marriage. Now, Joseph had apparently treated Paul Marriage and therefore was well aware of his mental instability, as well was the rest of the family, his parents contended. Muriel and Jim Sutton tried again to sue the marriages, but again the lawsuit was rejected. While the facts of this case are incredibly tragic, the Sittens have not and cannot factually allege the existence of a legal duty under Florida law as it currently exists, Palm Beach County Circuit Judge Minu Sasser said in an 11-page ruling. Patrick Knight's lawsuit was also thrown out. So here we are, 12 years later. Jim and Muriel Sutton have been blessed with two more daughters and still live in the home where the Thanksgiving massacre took place. Jim Sutton told Kelly Dunn of WPTV that one awful night does not erase the years of happiness they spent with Michaela in their home. Now, I couldn't even think of leaving now. I don't think it's possible to leave this house. You leave this house and you leave all of those memories. As for the rest of the family... They have apparently moved on and kept a low profile since all of the chaos. There are no follow-up interviews or anything that I can find, although I didn't dig super deep. It's probably best that they be left alone. Well, one thing like with Patrick Knight, I can understand his lawsuit. I was going to kind of bring this up a minute ago, but I mean, this guy, he was about to leave. So Patrick Knight was ready to leave and he was waiting on his wife. He was actually outside when Paul got his gun and went inside. So he was literally waiting on his wife. So 10 minutes goes by, he's out the door. So I'll, I mean, he lost, I mean, he was, he was in a coma. He lost his wife, his baby. And the other thing too is, you I mean, a lot of people forget that sometimes when they say, you say things like, oh, you know, he survived. He was in a coma for four months and he survived. Well, Three months. Was it three months? Three months, yeah. yeah. He was in a coma for three months. I apologize. He was in a coma for three months, but survived. It's not just you wake up out of a coma and you're good. I mean, there was there was physical rehab, mental rehab. I mean, there was so many things that he had to endure. So I can understand Patrick Knight's anger. He's one of the people that I really, I don't want to say I side with, but he, I really feel for in this case. Obviously, I feel for everyone in this case. Um, and there's one thing that I want to ask you about in a minute. Or actually, I'll ask you right now. Is Paul, was he living with his biological parents? I get the sense when I was doing the research that his mother was a stepmom. No, no, I'm pretty sure they were his biological parents. Okay. I just, for some reason, I couldn't quite put that together. I didn't see that. Um, and then you have, obviously, Michaela's parents um, because she was young, beautiful little kid. Well, and think about the think about his parents – in a way, they lost all three of their children. They lost their two twin daughters because their son murdered them. And obviously they lost their son, who they weren't close with, but 
imagine losing all your children in one night. Yeah. And and one of your children is responsible for that. And theoretically, you lost them too at that moment, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's it's really sad. Yeah, this is a very, very tragic um, situation because now you have so many lives that are altered. This is one family who was together and was enjoying a meal together, and then one person out of the family, you know, you, you hear those stories where, you know, where grandma has a little bit too much eggnog at the party or so-and-so drink a little too much rum, and next thing you know... That's like every year with my family. Yeah, well, my family too. But Thanksgiving turns into a problem, and there's always like, you know... I remember like when I used to go visit my mom at Christmas time, there was always one person in my family on my mom's side that would just figure out a way to just make it uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but this is a uncomfortable to obviously to an extreme. It's just so tragic. And, you know, you really think of Thanksgiving as, you know, this heartfelt moment where you're spending time with your family you haven't seen and it's really great. And I don't know, it's just terrible that this situation would happen. Yes, it, it is. So remember... This Thanksgiving, be thankful, along with everyone else, that no one in your family is trying to murder you. Indeed. Hopefully. Indeed. So, Lauren, I guess that's going to be it for tonight. Yes, that is our Thanksgiving story. Very tragic story. Again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash palmahawkmedia. That's P-A-L-A-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. And again, check out our website for links to our social media, Patreon, and our merch store. Please make sure to subscribe to this show on whatever platform you're listening on and rate and review. This really, really, really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. So thank you everyone for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.